I have a website and there's a page I want to tell you about. The website, I think most of you know, I have a collection of things I've written through the years on a lot of different topics, uh, biblical subjects, biblical books, the notes from the class, and this class will eventually be put up there. Uh, there's maybe 1,500 pages or more of material up there, and uh, I just bring it to your attention. I put it up there. It's, a, it's an attempt by me to, to serve Christ somehow, so this material is there. I, I get nothing from it other than that. But I want to, if you see it, you like it, and you tell other people about it, I would appreciate it. Then another page that I have, this is not on my website. This is on a website called uh, True Origin that's, that's maintained by a fellow named Tim Wallace. And this is a page that I have this, uh, a great deal of work has gone into this. I've kept this page at his place for probably 10 years or more. But recently I went through a whole a wholesale uh, revision of it. And I have there is a categorized list of 1,028 currently online articles of interest to creationists. And these are the best online articles in my judgment that you can find on the Internet. Most of them are written by PhDs, MDs. Uh, So if you're interested in that subject, uh, give that list a look. I think you'll appreciate it. Okay, first, Peter. Uh, Last week, we just introduced the book and first Peter was written by the Apostle Peter probably from Rome, around A.D. 62 or 63. I went through all that, and I won't go through it all again. That's where I come down on it. He's writing it from Rome around that time. And his intended audience is mainly Gentile Christians who are located in five regions of Asia Minor. And you see here, I, I pointed out that Bithynian Pontus was, it was a, a, a single province at the time, but he lists them as Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, I'm thinking probably because if the letter carrier started out in the eastern side of that united province, he could refer to that as Pontus. And then when he comes back around delivering the letter, he's in Bithynia. I also mentioned to you that it's it's quite possible, uh, maybe likely, that that he's writing to people not in the same areas where Paul had had his uh, missionary activity. If you look at this map, you see that. They have the letter going down to the same area, Caesarea, Iconium, and down there. But it's quite possible that the loop doesn't go that far south, that it's up further in northern Galatia, northeastern Asia, and then back up in Bithynia. So if somebody that Peter's writing to these these Gentile Christians, uh, he's writing to them in these sections in Asia Minor. And Peter's reference in chapter 1, verse 12, to those who have preached the gospel to you, It suggests that he didn't personally evangelize these Christians, but he's an apostle. But he didn't evangelize them, but he's aware, apparently, that they're having difficulties, that they are they are undergoing uh, hardships and suffering some kind of persecution. And most people are convinced, most scholars today are convinced that the persecution they were experiencing was a local unofficial persecution. Uh, In other words, it's not something emanating by decree from Rome. What it is, is you just have the people in the Roman society aren't liking Christians. And so all out through, throughout the society, you have them talking against them, upset by them, uh, hassling them, looking down on them and that kind of thing. And here's the quote I gave you from uh, D.A. Carson and Douglas Moo's introduction to the New Testament. It says, by refusing to engage in the quasi-religious customs surrounding the official Roman governmental structures... By resolutely setting themselves against some of the immoral practices prevalent at the time and by meeting so often on their own to celebrate the Lord's Supper, Christians were regarded with suspicion and hostility. The readers of First Peter were probably being criticized, mocked, discriminated against and perhaps even brought into court on trumped up charges. This situation fully explains the references to suffering in First Peter, including 510 since Christians throughout the empire were indeed suffering this same kind of treatment. And chapter 4, verses 14 and 16, since the readers were indeed suffering because they followed Christ and bore his name. And I mentioned last week how this seems to me to be paralleling more uh, where we're going. You know, whereas, you know, being a Christian is becoming something where people, they get angry about it. I don't know what your experience is, but you can run into people who just because you're a Christian, they get an attitude right away and they start to, you know, hostility comes out. Anything Christian. And I think we're moving more and more into that kind of time. Now, Peter's writing to encourage them to endure in the face of the difficulties. As you experience hardship for your faith, 
it is easy to start rationalizing a walking away from that faith. You saw the same thing in Hebrews where you're getting pressured. It's easy to start saying, well, you know, look, uh, you know, this Christ thing is uh, and it's easy. See, when it when it, when it's all, hey, this is all great. Everybody's with me. It's wonderful, wonderful. You see, but when there's a price to be paid for you, say, I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you must be a bigot. You must be hateful. You must be judgmental. You must be a pinhead. OK, well, nobody likes to, you know, I, you know, I want people to think I'm really bright. You know, I want them to think, well, you're a genius. You see, so you don't you don't want that. So you get this kind of temptation to, to shrink back. And he's encouraging them and writing to them not to do that. Now, Peter greets them in chapter one, verses one and two. We talked about that last week. And then beginning in verse three, he speaks to them of the blessing of salvation. That's where I want to pick back up. And you can see how this is relevant to the situation where you say, listen, these people are getting the hammer and he's going to reinforce for them. Listen, salvation is a tremendous, tremendous thing. OK, and he's going to talk about that. Here he is in chapter chapter one, verses three through nine. I'll talk a little bit about the translation. Those who've been in the class, what I do is I I try to be as woodenly literal as I can get away with. Sometimes woodenly literal is just incomprehensible. So you have to make some. But I try to be. You may think this is incomprehensible, but I'll explain what I'm doing. Why? The, you know, if it differs from, uh, you know, the, the version that you have, I'll explain that. And if ever you have some particular question about uh, a specific aspect of the of a translation, you can email me because that would be easier at Ashby Camp at Cox dot net. And I do that because then I have all the resources at my house and I can explain to you more fully why I chose what I chose. OK, chapter chapter one, verse three. Praise be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has given us a new birth into a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now you see, I've underlined the three prepositions that deal that that's because of the structure. I want you to see they're the same preposition. And you can see that he's saying into he's given us a new birth into into into. And sometimes that's lost when we break this up into different sentences. But he says he's given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that is imperishable undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are protected by the power of God into the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, in which time you will greatly rejoice, though now, if it is necessary, you've been grieved a little while in various trials in order that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold, which, though perishable, is tested by fire may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom not having seen you love, in whom not now seeing but believing, you will greatly rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy on receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, Peter here, he, he says that God the Father is to be praised for his great mercy in bringing Christians into a living hope, a vibrant hope, a meaningful hope. He's to be praised for bringing us into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, he means, of course, that our hope has been provided by what Christ endured on our behalf, which is represented in the resurrection. The resurrection serves as a as a representation of all that Christ has done. He died for our sins. And Peter will say that in chapter two, verse twenty four, chapter three, verse 18. And his resurrection, it demonstrates God's approval of that sacrifice. That's why the resurrection He's given us a new birth through the resurrection, because the resurrection demonstrates God's approval of that sacrifice and or it's part of the completion of. Of that sacrifice. We don't often think of it that way, but it certainly seems possible to me that his resurrection and ascension is part of completing the entire sacrificial process in that the Lord entered heaven itself. He says in Hebrews once for all by his own blood in chapter nine, verse 12 and chapter nine, verse 24. So you have there this picture of him entering the true holy of holies. 
in the very presence of God. So I can see it as also part of the completion. But he says he's given us new new birth into this vibrant, meaningful hope through what he has done on our behalf, which is represented by his resurrection from the dead. And then Peter spells out the substance of this living hope. He's given us a new birth into a vibrant, meaningful hope. And then he spells out the substance of this meaningful hope in two ways. He says, first, this hope is an inheritance. It is an inheritance, see, which is a term that presupposes a familial relationship with the father. That's how inheritance works. You see, father to son. It presupposes this relationship of father and son. And you can see that in Romans 8, 15, 17, Revelation 21, verse 7. This idea of inheritance presupposing a familial relationship. But he says the substance of this hope, it is, it is inheritance. And he describes this inheritance so that we can't miss the value of it. He says it is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It is imperishable. It is eternal. What you are going to inherit, what you will receive is eternal. But it is also undefiled, meaning it's precious. It has tremendous value. Its value hasn't been lessened or tainted. It is eternal. It is precious. And it is unfading in that it is constant. It is not that it's going to be this tremendous value that goes on forever and then it fluctuates or diminishes over time. No, it is eternal. It is precious and it is constant. The greatest, the best forever and ever. You see, so he wants them to see. Why does he want them to see this? He wants them to see because you have to keep your eye on that when you're suffering. You see, you have to keep your eye on that. What is in store for me? What is in store for me in the faithfulness of my confession? Jesus is Lord and I'm hanging to that. Okay, so he wants them to see, wants them to value it and understand it. And he says it's kept in heaven, which means it's completely secure. You see, the faithful will not one day go there and find the cupboard empty. I sit and you say, well, I was faithful. You know, I was laboring Under this idea, well, you know, if there's no God, let's eat and drink and be merry and all that for tomorrow we die. But I was laboring in faith and I get there and it's going, "Eh -eh." that's not going to happen. You see, that's not going to happen, that it's kept in, in heaven, it is protected. On the contrary, the faithful are protected by God's power. As we hold to God by holding on to the Lord Jesus Christ, as we like madmen. Hang on to that confession. Hang on to that truth. Will not let the world shake us from that. As we hold on to God, nothing can deprive us of the blessing God intends for us. There is no power as we hold on to Jesus in faith that will come in and say, I'm bigger than he is. I'm going to overpower him. I'm going to trump him. Yes, you're holding on to Christ and trusting that you're going to receive this inheritance, but I'm going to stop that. That's not going to happen. Because those who are faithful are protected by the power of God, who is the Almighty. He is the one who spoke the cosmos into existence. He is the greatest, the most powerful. There is nothing that rivals him. And so as we hold, he protects us. And nothing will deny us the blessings that God intends to give the faithful. Now, it is a salvation, he says. So he spells out the substance of this living hope, this vibrant, meaningful hope. He spells it out in two ways. He says that it's an inheritance. It is something that we are to receive from our father. But then he also says it is the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Okay, meaning the time of final judgment at Christ's return. There is something in store for us. There is something that is coming. There is an inheritance we are going to receive, a blessing we are going to get, that is ready to be revealed in the time of the final judgment at Christ's return. Here's how Wayne Grudem puts it in his commentary in the Tyndale uh, commentary series. He says, salvation is used here in verse 5, not of past justification or of present sanctification, speaking in theological categories, but of the future full possession of the blessings of our redemption, of the final, complete fulfillment of our salvation. Though already prepared or ready, it will not be revealed by God to mankind generally until the last time, the time of final judgment. 
As I have said many times, I'm going to say more again later in the study. It is a fundamental aspect of New Testament theology is that Christ is coming again to consummate the kingdom he inaugurated at his first coming. Christ comes and he inaugurates his kingdom. We saw it. I spent a, a class and a half talking about it when we looked at the parables. He comes and he ushers in the kingdom of God. But there is a sense in which that the kingdom awaits a consummation. It awaits the fulfillment at his return. So it is a present reality. But this isn't all that there is. There is a time coming when he returns. There's going to be the final judgment. We will be resurrected as Christ the first fruits. We will be resurrected, which means body. Okay, not ghosts forever. Body resurrected as Christ the first fruits, and we will spend eternity in a creation that has been completely redone. Okay, where the curse has been lifted. A complete, uh, there's been a, the total makeover. The makeover to end all makeovers. It is the new heaven and new earth, and we will spend eternity there in tremendous joy, perfect fellowship with God and one another. That is the hope. That is the Christian teaching. That is the truth for a millennia. And that's what he's talking about here. At that time, that inheritance will be ours. Now, there is a waiting time. Those who've died before, those who will die before that comes. There is an intermediate state. And we looked at that when we looked at Lazarus and the parables. But there is a time coming when Christ returns, the final judgment and we get, you know, that this whole creation is in Romans 8. It's groaning, waiting for the redemption. God hasn't lost out to Satan. It wasn't he came in and says, listen, I beat him here. He's got to scrap it and start over. Creation is redeemed in an analogy to us being redeemed. There is continuity and there is discontinuity. See, we are going to be resurrected, but we will not be resurrected as we are. We'll be resurrected immortal, imperishable. You see, we'll be resurrected as the first fruit, Jesus Christ. Okay, this to, this to me is, uh, in fact, there was a guy, Michael Byrd, I, I'll quote him later. He's an up-and-coming uh, New Testament scholar, and he, his book, Introducing Paul, he said that when he was younger, he read George Ladd's book, A Theology of the New Testament, said it was a really amazing book, loved it. And uh, he said he thought as he was reading, he says, I, I think eschatology appears on every page of this book. And he began to wonder, he said, you know, is New Testament theology really like an outflow of eschatology? And he said, after 10 years of study, he says, I now believe that's true. And we downplay that. Part of the reason I think we downplay this future looking of what is in store for Christians is because it seems so radical. Well, creation's radical. You see, creation is radical and recreation and remaking is going to be radical. But it is the Christian hope. Okay, now he says back to there. The reaction of the saved on that day, I've got to explain a little bit here. He says, into an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, verse 5, who through faith are protected by the power of God, into the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, in which time you will greatly rejoice. Now, I've got to stop and say a little bit here. Okay, now verse 6, it begins with a preposition, a prepositional clause that just simply says, in which. Okay, so you're left with a question, what does in which refer to? What is the antecedent of in which? Now, there are many scholars who believe that the antecedent, they take it as a neuter and they think, they say, listen, what he's referring to is all the blessings that he's talked about in verses 3 through 5, so that we have all of those things. But see, I am with many modern or many ancient commentators and a good number of modern commentators like J. Ramsey Michaels and Leonard Gopelt and James Moffat and Charles Big and Troy Martin and... There are a lot of I'm with those guys who say, listen, I think what in which refers to is the very last clause that precedes it in the last time. It matches it in gender and number. So, I mean, it's and it comes right after it. So you say, well, in the last time, that's why I say in which time you see, I put the little bracket there so you'll know how I'm reading that. I think what he's saying is saying in that time on that day. When Jesus Christ returns and the kingdom is consummated and Christians enter into the glorious uh, joy of the consummated kingdom, on that day, you will greatly rejoice. 
Okay, now what that requires, see, if, if, if that's the correct reading, you say, well, wait a minute. Uh, you may not say this, but, but people who are tuned into this say, well, you see this, this verb here, greatly rejoice. That's a present verb, present tense. So how are, you, how are you justified in giving that a future meaning? That seems like you're playing fast here. Okay, that's a good question. But present tense verbs in circumstances like this can have future meanings. Okay, they can have, they can have a future meaning. And let me read to you what J. Ramsey Michael says. He, he wrote a commentary on First Peter in what's the word biblical commentary series, a highly regarded commentary, and he's a highly regarded scholar. But he says, the best option remains the present indicative with a future meaning. In confident assertions regarding the future, especially prophecies, BDF section 323, BDF is an advanced Greek grammar. It's Bloss, De Bruner, and Funk. And he says, BDF section 323, a present tense can stand for the future. If the time element is a step, so you can't just do this willy nilly. Just say, I want to just make future tenses have, I mean, present tenses have future meanings. But there are, there are circumstances in which you can see that's the case. He says, if the time element is established by the context, in this instance, in ho, in which, linked to the preceding in Cairo escato, in last time, the present becomes semantically a zero tense taking a future meaning from the context. And he cites an article from the Westminster Theological Journal in the 60s by this guy Reynolds. Such an understanding accounts for agaliaste in verse 6 and will be found applicable in verse 8 as well. It is this interpretive insight, not a primitive textual tradition, that most plausibly explains the persistence of the future verb forms exultabitus and gaudabitus in Latin translations of verses 6 and 8. That last part he's saying you have Irenaeus and other Latin writers who, when they refer to this text, they refer to it using a future tense of the Latin. And he's saying the way you understand that, it better than saying, well, they were reading a different text. You say, no, the better way of understanding it is that they understood that in context this had a future meaning. That's why we're doing it. All right. I may be getting you know, too far in the weeds here. But when I do something like this, I want to tell you why I'm doing it. So you don't just sit here and think that, you know, this guy just throws out junk. OK, it, it, it may not be right. I'm telling you, there are there are a number of people who would resist what I'm telling you. But I think it's right. OK, I think it's right for a number of reasons. You know, it seems to me that not only do you have that, it can mean that. But in my view, this best fits. See, taking this as a future, it best fits with the temporal contrast that you get with though now. You see, in you know, it should say in which time, in, in which time I see why well, I had to go back and change it. And I didn't put this. I originally had it in this in which time you will greatly rejoice, though. Now, you see, there's a contrast here. Now you're getting a hammer. Now you're suffering. Now you're having the hardship. But then you see, but then so it's, it, it seems to me it fits with that, that they're suffering now. But on that future day, they'll greatly rejoice. And the future orientation of this is, is, in my view, further supported by verse 7. The reference there to their faith being found to result in what praise, glory, and honor when? At the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay? Being found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And also in verse 9, you see they're receiving the end result of their faith, the salvation of their souls. The end game, the final thing, the end result of their faith. The salvation of their souls. So that's why I think the, the people who see it this way, I side with them. Uh, that makes more sense to me. OK, that he's talking about that. Now, this doesn't mean that Christians don't rejoice in some deep sense through the sorrow of present trials. You see, there is this paradoxical sense in which we do indeed rejoice in a deep sense because of what we have. OK, it doesn't mean there is that kind of rejoicing, but it means there's a sense of unparalleled rejoicing that will characterize our entrance into the consummated kingdom of God. I've said many times it's going to be a party like none other. We will be resurrected and there will be that day when I will be squeezing you and hugging you in that reality. Amen. You see, and it will be a, be a celebration. We'll be going. Do you remember sitting around? Do you remember talking about these glorious things? And here we are experiencing it. It's going to be great. See, that's why there's going to be a rejoicing that is just unparalleled. The ultimate celebration, 
the ultimate just joy and tears of joy and just happiness flowing out. Perfect fellowship with one another and with God. It is the divine utopia. It is a reality that maxes out all your expectations. It is a glory like none other. You know what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7? But our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Well, I look at Paul's life. Paul was getting beat all over the Mediterranean. What's Paul say? I'm looking at the unseen, baby. <laughs> I'm looking. I got, I got my eyes set on what is in store for the faithful. So when you're being ground, when you're being pressed, you're being having difficulties, you're being tempted to say, I need to back off this Jesus thing. It's causing it to rain on me. Well, what do you say? Say, you better keep your eyes fit and focused on what's important. Keep your eyes. And that's what I think Peter is doing for them here. Peter explains that the various trials they were suffering, they were a testing of their faith. Just as gold is tested so that it, their faith, its genuineness may result in their praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Christ. Now, that strikes us as odd. What do you mean? That, yes. Well done, good and faithful servant. We receive praise and honor from God on that day. You see, you can see that, for example, in Romans chapter 2, verse 29, where he talks about the praise, their praise is from God. Peter will speak about honor. The honor, therefore, is for you who believe. In chapter 2, verse 7, you see this idea in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, 1 Peter 5, 4, and many other places. That there is going to be given to us as we are vindicated and stand as God's precious people. That is praise, glory, and honor. And that is ours. When Jesus Christ is revealed and we have shown ourselves to be faithful through the trials that burn off the dross and show that our faith, our faith is genuine. Our faith isn't the kind of faith that when we get tempted and pressured, we say, that's too bad. Okay, I sell. Really wasn't worth it. Now, we hold, like I'm saying, like a mad dog. We hold to that faith. And as we come through the genuineness of that faith, what do we receive on that day? Well done. We receive honor from God the Father. We receive honor from Him. Here's what uh, 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 J. Ramsey Michael says. He says, Peter has in mind explicitly the praise, glory, and honor that God bestows on His servants and only implicitly the praise, glory, and honor that is His in the act of giving. So He bestows that. It is by His mercy. So His giving us praise, glory, and honor does redound to His glory. But in the first instance, explicitly, he's focusing on our praise, glory, and honor that is ours as our faith is proved genuine on that day. And we have God say, well done, good and faithful servant. This is what is in store for us. You see, I know the world is constantly sitting here telling you, you know, I don't don't know how to say this any stronger. You know, I feel like my head's going to explode. Look, the world is constantly telling us. This isn't worth anything. What's really worth something is sleeping with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or stoning or doing whatever's cool. That's real life. Don't listen to these people. This isn't really valuable. This is valuable. Come over here. Come over here. Come over here. And I'm trying to reinforce the spirit of God through Peter is trying to tell these people who are getting pushed. He's trying to say to them, listen to what is important. Don't be hypnotized. Don't be in a fog. Don't get sucked in. Keep your eyes on what's important and you hold to Jesus Christ in faith. That's what he's telling them. And that message has to be heard. It has to be heard today. Now, in speaking of the salvation of their souls, you see down here, it says on receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter is not just referring to the salvation of some immaterial aspect of their being. See, as we typically think of soul as simply the, you know, soul is just the non-material, the spiritual aspect. That is not what Peter's talking about. As Peter Davids says in his commentary, his is in the New International Critical Commentary series, he's using the word in its common Hebrew sense of the total person, the self. You say, oh, I don't know, why do you think that? Well, you can see it quite clearly, for example, in his statement in chapter 3, verse 20, that eight souls were saved through water. And he's referring to Noah and his family. 
What do you think he meant that only the spiritual part of Noah and his family came through? No, he's talking about a being, a person, and that's perfectly consistent with how Hebrews would look at it. You see, he's not simply talking about that. Here's what Thomas Schreiner says in his uh, commentary. He says, salvation of souls could easily be misunderstood by moderns as if Peter referred to the salvation of our immaterial substance. The word souls, however, refers to the whole person and does not suggest in any way that the body is left out. The reference is to a person's whole life or self-identity. Similarly, you have Paul Actemeyer in his commentary in Hermeneia series. He says, the eschatological context, the end time perspective at home in the Hebrew rather than the Greek tradition gives to souls the sense of the salvation of the entire person rather than simply the rescue of a higher or spiritual part of a person in contrast to the body. That's Gnosticism. See, one of the first great heresies the church faced was this Gnosticism that was so anti-material things, it viewed matter as evil in itself, as something that had come from some lesser God. And Gnosticism's thing was you took the spark of the divine, the spiritual, the inner, and it was freed from the material. Well, that's not biblical. You see, resurrection is biblical. You see, restoration and renewal is biblical. And so he's just talking about this and he says, because such Hebrew tradition in which the human being is understood to be a psychosomatic unity is dominant in the New Testament, redemption here, salvation, is understood in terms of a new creation rather than of the release of the soul from imprisonment in the body. Now, here he says, a translation that implies salvation of only part of the person, like a translation soul to modern ears, he says, is therefore misleading, since First Peter elsewhere, soul is used to mean the whole person, as in the example I gave you in chapter 3, verse 20. Now, I keep the translation soul. I do it because I'd rather give the words as literal as I could than I'll tell you my thinking about it, instead of bootlegging that into the translation itself. But I don't fault somebody who does that, because if you're doing a translation for general readers, you have other things in mind. OK, so he's just saying, listen, you have to be careful, because when people today hear soul, they think spirit. And Peter is talking about the whole person. OK, so I can say soul and then go through all this and tell you that. All right. OK, so. Chapter one, verse 10, verse 10 to 12, he says, concerning this salvation. The prophets who prophesied about the grace to come to you diligently searched and carefully inquired, inquiring into what time or what sort of time the spirit of Christ within them was indicating when predicting the sufferings coming to Christ and the glories after these things. It was revealed to them that they were presenting these things not for themselves, but for you. Which things have now been announced to you by those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven into which things angels long to look. Now, Peter, is, remember, he's they're suffering. Peter is trying to get them to grasp, to appreciate the value of the salvation that has been given to them by the mercy of God, the father. And so he is going to emphasize, highlight, accentuate the greatness of that salvation. And he highlights the greatness of it by noting that Old Testament prophets, okay, prophets uh, who through the spirit foretold of the coming of this salvation, they were so taken by its glory that they expended themselves trying to discern the time or the general period when the means and grounds of that salvation, that is the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent exaltation about which they were prophesying, when that would occur, it was that glorious that as they saw it, they were expending themselves and trying to get a bead on when is this coming down? When is this going to happen? Why? Because this is so great. And we sit here and got people in the church that yawn about, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm saved, you're saved. You know. It's okay. It's no big deal. What's on TV? You know, it's like, and the Spirit of God is saying, do you understand? Do you understand that the prophets who delivered this were so enraptured by it that they were looking and trying to determine the times? Now, there are numerous references in the New Testament to the Old Testament's predictions about Christ. 
For example, Jesus says in Matthew eleven thirteen, very generally, he says that all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. See, meaning that the entire Old Testament, even its commands, had a prospective or a forward looking aspect to it. And in Matthew five seventeen, it shows that Jesus is the fulfillment of that aspect. All of the Old Testament, even its commands, has this thing that's looking forward. And Jesus is the fulfillment of that forward look. But you also get texts like this, Luke 24, 25 to 27. And Jesus said to them, and he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets... He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Luke 24, 44 to 47. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Paul says in Acts 26, 22, and 23, To this day I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and and to the Gentiles. First Corinthians, Paul says, first Corinthians 15, three and five, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. So you have this idea, you obviously have uh, all kinds of New Testament references to what the Old Testament had said, and Peter is saying that the prophets who prophesied such things, were so gripped by them that they were longing to say, when is this? When is this going to happen? Here's what Grudem says. He says, in this sense, this sense of the entire Old Testament being writings of the prophets, in that sense of that first verse that I gave you. He says, the predictions of the sufferings of the Messiah begin with the prediction of the seed of the woman who would be bruised in the heel by the serpent, Genesis 3.15, and continue through much of the Old Testament writing. Then he cites many Psalms, Isaiah, Zechariah. The Messiah's subsequent glory is predicted in Psalms, uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Malachi, etc. So you just you see that there is there is a lot of this where. You, you have them and they're interested. So, but the point is the greatness and the glory of the salvation that is ours. That has come to us. How are we so distracted and pour so much energy and in things into everything else under the sun? So that when you're sitting here saying, can, can you can I have some of that energy for something a bit more directly related to this? I don't have time for that. I can't mess with that. It just just, seems to be something about a lack of appreciation. Now, the Holy Spirit who inspired the Old Testament prophets is here called the Spirit of Christ. Okay, same same way he's called in Romans chapter eight, verse nine. And you see similar kinds of references in Acts 16, seven, Galatians four, six, Philippians one, 19. Now, he's called the Spirit of Christ because he's the same spirit who was sent from Jesus. You see in verse 12 right here where he says, verse 12, he says that, uh, you know, sent from heaven. So he's the same spirit sent from Jesus. And you see him being sent from Jesus in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, Acts chapter 2, verse 33. But he's also called the spirit of Christ because he bears witness to Christ and glorifies Christ. You see that in John 15, verses 26, John 16, verses 13 and 14. Let me end with this. I have a fairly lengthy quote from uh, Jim McGuigan. McGuigan is a preacher in Northern Ireland, a a member of the church in his book, Where the Spirit of the Lord Is. And sometimes we get a little, uh, you know, you see not just in churches of Christ, but in evangelicalism generally, you see you see people saying, you know, we, we, we just need to focus more on the spirit. We need to focus more on the spirit. Uh, you know, we're we're downplaying the spirit. Let me read to you how McGuigan looks at this, and I think there's a lot to it, okay? He says, the Spirit brings glory to Christ, 
by refusing to put himself on center stage. Whatever the Spirit does and however he does it, it is to be understood in light of Jesus' own proclamation, he will bring glory to me. We've all known people who were the dynamic behind whatever was going on. And while we knew they were at work, they didn't parade or proclaim their presence. They were hiding in plain sight. They did their job so well that people looked at what was being accomplished more than at the prime mover in the venture. The Spirit of God models this behavior for us. He doesn't want first place because there is no life without him. Because we have no Christ without him, because he does so much, we're tempted to forget why he does what he does. The Spirit does what he does to glorify the Christ, to bring the Christ, to represent the Christ. He never parades his own presence, even though he insists that we know he is present. And when the Spirit leads people to speak and they cannot speak without him, they speak of the Master and not of him. The spirit suffers from no identity crisis, yet you never hear him say, behold me. Rather, over and over and over again, he says, behold him. To say we shouldn't glorify the spirit would be nonsense. To say we shouldn't delve into his nature and work would be sheer ignorance. But one of the reasons that less has been said about the spirit down the centuries than about the father and son is because the Holy Spirit has unceasingly pointed to the father and the son. That he himself should be praised and glorified is only proper, but it honors the spirit when we pay attention to the focus of his work in the world. He is not the focus of his own labors. In pointing away from himself, the spirit is not putting himself down. He is exalting the Christ. So I just want to say that in that idea of, you know, the spirit, we slight the spirit. I just want you to take into account in that calculation That as we exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, we are honoring the Spirit of God because the Spirit points to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see? So it is not like, you know, that that to be doing that, we have to be sitting here and singing, well, we got to give equal time to the Spirit. Okay, I think that's kind of a warping, and I just give you that for what it's worth. Thanks for coming.